Hi. Today we're going to do another physics lab, and in this physics lab, we're going to be dealing with circular motion. Now, circular motion confuses people because some odd things are going on. So first we're gonna have a little talk about that. If something's moving in a circle, and this is for moving in a circle at constant speed, by the way, what's going on with it? Well, we start with Newton's first law. Newton's first law says objects moving in straight lines at constant speeds have no net force on them. Is this moving at constant speed? Yes, it is. Is it moving in a straight line? No, it is not. That means that there is a force working on this object. Even though it's moving at a constant speed, somehow there's a force on it doing things. What's going on with this? Well, if you look in your book, you can find a nice derivation of what's happening. I'm just going to cut to the chase. The way it works out is if we have, here's the center of a circle, an object moving at constant velocity around the circle. So we have something going like this. Then that object is subjected to a force that makes it accelerate toward the center of the circle. And the magnitude of the force, A is the change in velocity with respect to time, and that's equal to V squared over R. That's the magnitude of the acceleration, the direction of the acceleration is toward the center of the circle. This is the confusing part about circular motion. We have an acceleration, we have a velocity, but they're at right angles to each other. They're not pointing in the same direction. Weird. What does that do? Well, it means that this velocity changes as it goes around the circle. And if it's moving in a circle, you can see how the velocity changes. It starts out going that way, a little bit later, when it gets over here, it's in this direction. The velocity is always tangent to the circle. The acceleration is always toward the center of the circle. They're at right angles. The right angles part is the part that makes the speed stay constant. The change in direction is because every uh, instant of time, the velocity changes by a little bit perpendicular to itself. It brings it around in a circle. It comes back to where it started from. What we're going to do with our experiment today is have something go around in a circle. We're going to measure forces on it, and we're going to calculate things and come up and try and calculate what the angle of the string is. We'll do that in a minute. This is just the introduction. Here we go. Okay, now to do the circular motion experiment, we have to have something moving in a circle. And what we've come up with is this thing known as the whirly gig. And this is how you assemble it. First, I took the string and I doubled it. So I looped it back on itself so it'd be twice as strong. I tied both ends to the paper clip on this side. And I put six washers on the paper clip. You can vary the number of washers. Six seem to work for me today. I put the doubled string through the hollow handle, so it's going right through there. And on the other end, I put my other paper clip and put the paper clip through the rubber stopper. Now, put all this together, you should have something like this. Everything's on one line. Uh, the way we're going to work this thing is you hold the handle in the middle, you let the washers hang down, and then the idea, and I usually hit myself in the head several times doing this, is that the washer, the, ah, 
Oh, ah, ah, ah. It's hard doing this with cameras watching. The idea is that the stopper goes around in a circle, and what we're going to do is measure the force on the string, making it go in a circle. So you want to have it rotating way above your head, and then when this thing is really working, you can let go of the hanging washers, and it hits you in the head several times. But it's rubber, it will be okay. And you also will need a ruler to measure lengths, and we will need our uh, fishing scale thing to measure some masses. So that stuff is what it takes to do this experiment. We'll get back to it in a minute. First, I want to talk about how to analyze it and the physics of what's going on. Here's a little picture of it. This is the tube you hang on to. Here are your hanging washers. Here's the rubber stopper going around in a circle. And what we're going to measure is going to try and kind of eyeball what this angle is because the string drops down a bit. I want you to measure the length of this string. We'll talk about how to do that. And the last thing I want you to measure is the amount of time it takes to go around once. And we'll call that P for the period. And it's easiest to spin it around, count 10 laps, and have an assistant work a stopwatch while that goes on. What's the physics like of this? Well, let's go back and draw some free body diagrams to try and understand how all these things work out. We've got two objects in here, the two weights that we have to uh, figure out the forces on, and each one of them gets its own free body diagram. So I'm going to start with the washers, what forces are working on them. Well, as usual, we always have gravity. So gravity is pulling downwards on these things, and if the mass of the washers is big M, and the force of gravity is big M times G. If that was the only force, they would accelerate down to the floor. They don't do that. Something else is working on them. What is that? It's got to be the string. The string pulls upwards with a force that we're going to call T for tension. Those are the only forces working on the washers. There are no horizontal forces working on the washers. There's no horizontal acceleration, so just ignore that. And we'll talk about F equals MA in the vertical direction. And in the vertical direction, I have a positive tension upwards minus MG downwards. If it's not accelerating in the upwards direction, those two cancel each other. There's an equation for us. So that's one free body diagram. That's the easy one. The other one is the stopper. What happens with the stopper? It has a string tied to it, which is going off in that direction. Which forces are working on this thing? We've got weight, as always. This is small m times g downwards. And we've got the force of the string pulling upwards. But now instead of pulling straight vertically, it's pulling off at an angle. What angle is that? Well, if this angle up here is theta, then this angle here also has to be theta. So now we have to have some trig going on in this because we've got angles. Let's see what kind of equations we get out of this. Well, vertically, we have minus mg downwards, and pulling upwards is a force opposing that. It's sort of part of this tension. The tension is pulling sideways and upwards. And so in the vertical direction, we just have the vertical part of this tension. And with some trigonometry, you can see that if t looks like this, then you can make it out of vectors that go that way and that way. And so the vertical part is t times sine theta. 
And if it doesn't accelerate vertically, those two cancel, and you get zero. Horizontally, what's happening? Well, horizontally, there's only one force that's doing anything horizontally, and that's the other part of the tension. And one part pulling vertically, the rest of it is pulling horizontally. So horizontally, we have T times cosine theta, and that's it. Now, is that one equal to zero? No, it's not. And why is it not? It's not because the stopper is moving in a circle. It's accelerating toward the center of the circle. If it's accelerating toward the center, it means there has to be a net force toward the center. And that would be horizontal, and that would be that. It's equal to m times the acceleration of moving in a circle, which is v squared over r. So there are three equations from the free body diagrams. We've got this one about vertical balance on the washers, this one about vertical balance on the stopper, and this one, which is not balanced at all, about the force that makes the stopper go in a circle, that's given by this. This is really new, this idea that there is a force that's not balanced. It's kind of a new idea in this class. Here it is. That's how that works out. We have a couple more equations that kind of pop out of definitions. If you look at this, you'll see that we have R here. We, you know, where's R on that? We haven't measured that. We have V on here. We have to figure out how to get that. Uh, these are pretty straightforward. To get the velocity, what you need to know is the distance that the stopper travels in one lap divided by the amount of time it takes to go one lap. The amount of time it takes to go one lap is the period. So V equals 2 pi r. That's the distance of one lap around the circle divided by the period. We're almost done. We need something about r. What is r? r is the radius of the circle that the mass travels around. So it's the distance from out here back to here. And with a little more trigonometry, you can see that if this angle is theta, and if this is the hypotenuse of this right triangle, this is the side adjacent to theta, so r equals the hypotenuse, which is l, times the cosine of theta. And with all those equations, I think we now have everything defined. Uh, we can actually go ahead and do the experiment and analyze it. Okay, now it's time to actually do the experiment. And uh, this may be a little dicey, but here we go. So I have my whirly gig handle in my right hand. I'm holding the weights in my left hand, the washers, and I've got the stopper hanging and uh, hanging in midair. What I'm going to do is try and get the stopper rotating around hopefully above my head, and then I will try and hold the weights in a place where they don't move up or down. So the tension generated by the weights is what's making the tension in the string. And go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, Nine, ten. Okay. <laughs> now we have to, when you catch it, you have to try and hold things where they were because the distance between the top of the handle and where the stopper is is important. So you want to try and grab things and preserve where the washers were relative to the handle. And we put them on our 
ruler and we can measure how far it is from the top of the handle to the center of the stopper, which is 24 inches in this case. We will have to convert that to meters when we do the analysis, but there we're writing it down. All right, Mr. Assistant Man, how long did it take to do 10 revolutions? 10.03 seconds. 10.03 seconds. Well, that's an easy one to divide by because we know that the period is the amount of time for 10 divided by 10, which is one second each. That's good. The last thing we're gonna need are the masses of the weights and the stopper. We're ready to measure these masses. First we do the stopper. The stopper comes out, remember to read the gram side, 22 grams. And the hanging washers, all together, 42 grams. So let's write down those numbers. And we will have to convert those into kilograms to when we do the analysis. Uh, the last thing that is involved in here is theta. And theta, as you've seen, is kind of hard to measure. You wind up having to sort of guess at it. Uh, my camera people here assure me that when I was doing this experiment, theta was about 30 degrees. So we'll put that one up there. When you do it, you should have an assistant who can watch and try and guess at what theta is as you uh, go around and whirl this thing around your head. This is not by any means a precise experiment, so don't really sweat it that much. Okay, now we come to analyzing this experiment. We've got a lot of numbers that we've picked up. How do we make sense out of all this? Well, what we want to do with this, put all these numbers into a spreadsheet and wind up calculating the centripetal force, the force that makes the stopper go around in a circle. Uh, and we're gonna do that two ways and compare these two calculations. So centripetal force is the thing right here. Uh, one way to do it is this side of the equation. This is T cos theta. We haven't measured what T is, but we do know this equation, which tells us that T equals big M times G. So on this side of the equation, we have big M. We know what that is. G, we know what that is. Cos theta, we know what that is. That's calculating the centripetal force one way. The other way to calculate the centripetal force is with this expression. And with this expression, we know what little m is. That's 22 grams. What about V and R? Well, V comes out of this, which also depends on R, and R comes from this. We know what L is, it's 24 inches. We know what cos theta is. We should be able to put all this together. So on one side of our equation, we have this. The other side of our equation, we have little m, times v squared, which is this, 2 pi r over p squared. And that's divided by big R, which is L cos theta. And we're going to have to substitute that in for that r. But what we're going to do with the analysis is calculate this centripetal force two different ways and compare the results based on the numbers we got from the experiment. Let's go to the computer and make it all work in a spreadsheet. So off we go. The first column is the period in seconds. The next column is... Uh, Big L in inches, 
And we have one for big L in meters. And we have uh, one for little m. And because the conversion from grams to kilograms is so easy, I'll just do it on the fly. One for big M in kilograms. And uh, one for theta in degrees. So that's all my data columns. Let's put in some data for this. The period I have is one second. The uh, L in inches is 24 inches. L in meters comes from that times 0 0.0254, which I happen to know is the formula to convert inches to meters. Um, M in kilograms, M is 22 grams, that's 0 0.022 kilograms, you just divide by a thousand. And big M in kilograms is similarly 42 divided by 1,000, or 0 0.042. Finally, we have theta in degrees, which is 30. Put that in. Okay, so that's all the data we measured. The next step is to make some columns for derived quantities in here. The first one I want to get is R. That's the distance, the radius of the circle that the thing moves around in. So I'll put R in meters, and R in meters is equal to big L in meters times uh, cosine uh, of, of the angle theta. Now, as we found out last week, they want theta in radians for their cosine function, so I can't just put in the angle in degrees. I have to convert it to radians. And to do that, I multiply it by pi, 3.14156, divided by 180. And that should get me uh, the angle in radians, which is what they want for the cosine function. So I put all that together, and R turns out to be 0.5279 meters, which is a bit shorter than L, which is what it should be. Uh, it should be almost the same size as L, but a little bit less. There, that's working out. The next derived column I want is V for velocity, and I want that in meters per second. So to get V, what I have to do is take 2 pi times R and divide by the period, and I get another formula, 2 times 3.14159 times R, which I just got, and I divide that by the period in seconds, which is back in column 1. Put all that together, and we get a velocity of 3.3 meters per second. So now we've got those two. Finally, I want to compare t cos theta to mv squared over r. We found out t is mg. We'll make a column for that. mg cos theta, we'll call that. And that's equal to big M in kilograms times 9.8 times cos theta. And uh, cos, again, I'm going to have to convert to radians times 0.14159 divided by 180. So that's big M times G times cos theta. I got a value of 0.356 newtons out of that. I want another column 
which is this other calculation, m v squared over r, and that equals little m is back ways, little m in kilograms equals that, times v squared, v, one way to get a square is just to multiply a number by itself. It's v squared and divide by big R in meters, that's that, and we get that. So we have two ways to calculate this centripetal force. One of them comes up with 0.356 newtons, the other one comes up at 0.458. They're not particularly close, but they're not that far away from each other. Now, I only did this experiment once, I would like you to do it at least three times with different weights and uh, different tries and uh, if you have three tries you can kind of eliminate the worst ones and it's always a good idea. So what I want you to do now is to go out and try it by yourself. You're going to need an, an assistant, you will need a stopwatch of some sort, something on your phone is perfectly adequate and you will need somebody who can estimate what the angle is. You'll probably wind up hitting yourself in the head several times. I always do, but it's just a rubber stopper and it doesn't do any damage. Um, good luck with this. It's kind of a fun one and send me the results.